So why don't you join me in prayer and we'll continue in worship. Lord, I just thank you that we can be together this morning. I thank you, Lord, that uh, we can just worship you because we're free in Christ. I thank you, Lord, that we have forgiveness of sin only through Jesus Christ, a home in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternity. We thank you for Jesus Christ dying on a cross for us. We praise you. We thank you for that. We come together this morning to worship you as King of Kings. And Lord, I pray for your spirit now to lead us, for your spirit to direct us. I pray, Lord, that you'll just lead us as a church this morning. Lord, we come before you right now saying, Lord, we want to glorify and exalt you. And we want to learn and repent and do whatever is needed in our life. Because, Lord, we want to honor you. Lead us by your spirit. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why don't you just bow your heads? That song reminds us we become children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that we no longer have to fear with Jesus as our Savior. With Jesus as the one who is ever present with us. The one who leads and directs our life. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray for your spirit upon us this day. Lead us now as we open up your word. We thank you for the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that song. And, uh, you know, we've been on a uh, great journey. We've been going through the book of Romans for some time now. I'm not even sure exactly, but we've been in Romans and we looked at salvation. We looked at we're sinners. We're saved by His grace and His wonderful grace, we looked at God's sovereign work in the world. And we're going to see a little bit of that again today. And we've also seen as we look through Romans that we must, as Christians, submit our lives to Jesus Christ. Remember that? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If you got your Bible open, you ought to go on and open it up to Romans 12, Romans 13. Romans 12, what does he say? He says, hey, he says, I urge you. He says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Put that in today's language. He said, go submit your life fully to him, completely, totally. He even says in verse 2, go renew your mind. And then over the last few weeks we've looked at, he says, we're family at church. We're to love one another. We're to care for one another. At the end of chapter 12, he says, lay aside all bitterness. Lay aside all lack of forgiveness in your life. Lay aside resentment in your life. We talked about that last week. And you might be surprised. The very next verse, God says, I want to talk to you also about government. And you go, what? Government? Why do I have to talk about government? Why in the world will we talk about that? See, I get that we talk about the church, but the government? And I want to tell you, you'll see today, the Lord speaks to this subject multiple times in Scripture. And here's what God wants us to hear. He wants us to understand our role in society, our role as a citizen. And you may go, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. So if my citizenship is in heaven, why do I have to worry about today? That's a good question. And the Lord tells us that because we are citizens of heaven, we are to be good citizens on earth. I want you to remember that statement. Since Christians are citizens of heaven, we are to be good citizens, representing Jesus Christ here on earth. That is what God has called us to be. Now, boy, if I went around this room, I'll bet you I could have people say, Well, I don't really like the government so much. I bet some people might even say, when the government gets involved in something, uh uh-oh, it's going to get messed up, right? You've heard those comments. Or you may get aggravated about things like, boy, I really like when the government has nice roads, but I really don't like them paving and blocking my uh, traffic and, you know, getting me all messed up in my traffic pattern. Anything the government does, sometimes we complain about it, right? God's going to show us today some things that might step on a few toes. But I think what we need to do is look at what does Scripture say and not our opinion about our role with government. 
Now, I hope you have your Bible. Open up your Bible. Uh, open up your phone. Look at Scripture with me in Romans chapter 13. I want you to listen to these words. Now, remember where we were last week. We've been walking through this book, and he talks in the preceding verses about our relationship with one another, and there's no chapter break. And this is just a letter written by Paul, so he just starts a new thought there in Romans 13, verse 1. And he goes, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. Wow. And they who oppose will receive condemnation upon themselves. Verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, man. You know, that's in there too? Yeah. And he goes, for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Verse 7. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Now those are some strong verses. You will see as we go through the Bible and the text today that God reminds us very clearly. Look at that very first verse in Romans 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. He tells us right out of the blocks we are to be subject to governing authorities. And the word subject there, if you want to go study it, you might be surprised. It's actually a military term. And, and oh, by the way, there's another passage in Scripture that talks about being subject to the government, and it uses the same word. He says, just like soldiers follow the commands, you be in subject to your governing authorities. Now you may go, really? That's what Scripture says? Yep, that's what it says. Now, before we dig into this text, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork for us to understand what this exactly means. The first thing I want you to hear is that this is all over Scripture. God commands us to be model citizens, honoring and respecting government. Now, you may have a lot of questions about what does that mean. I'm going to try to explain that before we leave here in a few minutes. But that is something that's not just in Romans. And I want you to look with me. I do want you to look in Scripture because I want you to see it in Scripture and even write it down in Titus. Titus is a little book. If you're in your Bible, it's called First and Second Timothy. It's got uh, that, and then it says Titus and Philemon. Took right there before Hebrews. And in Titus chapter 3, he's writing. And look at Titus 3. He goes, remind them to be subject to rulers. There's that same word, subject to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing consideration for all men, showing every consideration for all men, for we also once were foolish ourselves. I won't keep reading. He says, honor, respect government. Go to 1 Peter. And if you were to look over in 1 Peter and, uh, and look at that text, it's probably another passage in 1 Peter that is very strong on this subject. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he has just said in the preceding verses that we're to share the gospel with people. And then he comes to 1 Peter 2 and he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, 1 Peter 2 verse 13, to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, 
but used it as bond slaves of God. Now look at verse 17 in Second Peter, I mean in 1 Peter 2. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Look at that next word. Honor the king. Was the king a good guy in the first century? No. What does Peter say? Honor the king. You could go look at history. There was severe persecution to the church. Nero actually burned Christians. There's severe persecution. In the Roman letter, in the first letter from 1 Peter, both of them say, submit to the government. If you were to go study government in that day and time, sexual immorality is rampant in society in that day and time. Corruption is all over the government. Tax collectors. Y'all remember Zacchaeus, that story? Zacchaeus, remember, he said, oh, I've taken money from people wrongly because that's what tax collectors did in that day and time. In that day and time, they taxed, but if they needed a little extra money, they could just raise the tax. They could cheat people. It was okay. They were government, and they could cheat. And what does Romans, Paul say in Romans, and in Peter, and in Titus? You obey them. You submit to them. You honor and respect the government. In Jeremiah chapter 29, he says, all of you Jewish people, when you go into captivity with the Babylonians, with the Persians, he says, you obey that government and make your life with them Even though there are enemies, you submit. You remember Daniel and Joseph? Did they submit to the government? Absolutely. So you're going, oh man, pastor, you're right. Some of this is kind of uncomfortable. But wait a minute, I want to go further. You may say, well, wait a minute, pastor, I remember in Scripture there's some people that didn't obey the government. And you're exactly right. The Bible does tell us there's an exception to this. And it says, if you are told to do something by government and you are to disobey the word of God, then you disobey the government. He is saying we always obey the word of God. We always our ultimate authority is God. And I'm going to hit these real quick. I'm not going to go in scripture. You'll remember the story. Exodus chapter 1 you remember the midwives were said by Pharaoh, kill the uh, Hebrew boys. Remember? What did the midwives say? Nah, we're not going to obey government. Because that's murder. And they feared God, it even tells us in that text. It says, no, they said, no way. We're not going to obey government if if we're being told to commit murder. In Daniel chapter 3, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, hey, they're building this great big old statue. You're to bow down and worship that. That's who's the king and the Lord in your life. He goes, no, uh -uh. our king is the true king of kings. Almighty God, and we're not bowing. And they said, well, you're going to die. Okay, we can we'll put our life in his hands. You remember that story. God took care of them. But they said, we're not obeying government. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's told, wait a minute. You're praying every day. They're going to make a new law. It says you can only make petition to the king. And Daniel says, not going to happen. He said, I'm still praying to my God. I'm still worshiping my God. I'm still bowing before my God every day. Y'all remember that story. What happened to Daniel? He goes to the lions. God took care of me. You go to Acts chapter 4. You remember Jesus has just ascended to heaven. Peter and John are proclaiming the gospel, and they get in trouble with the leaders of that day. And what do they say? You guys need to shut up and quit talking. And not only did they say, we're not going to do it, they went and go worship together with all the Jerusalem church there, saying, you're not stopping us. We're going to worship our God. We're going to praise our God. We're going to go and proclaim Jesus. He told us to go be witnesses, and we're going to go do it. And in Acts chapter 5, the very next chapter, you remember what they said? I love this this verse. In Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it says, We must obey God rather than man. That's exactly the principle that we need to remember. If it ever conflicts, we obey Scripture first and foremost. But if it doesn't conflict with Scripture, he's saying we obey government. So that's a long intro But let's go look now at the text to see what he tells us about application for us today in 2024. Now, in that first verse, I'm in Romans 13, verse 1, he goes, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, look at this, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. He is saying 
God authorizes all authority on earth. By the way, if you've noticed, I put a lot more verses in your notes today than normal because this particular subject is a subject we don't talk about a lot. So I put a lot of reference verses in case you want to go study it in your home. But what the Bible tells us is that God has established authority. It's, and, and if you want to make it simple, God has established the church. And he put authority in the church. God has established family. He's put authority in the family. And God has also said, I establish government as the authority for society. Those three blocks, God created them, has put authority in all of those. It is shown in all those verses that I put up there that you can go study. And if you wanted to go even further, if you go to the book of Ephesians, he says for all of us who work for somebody, he says you submit to your boss. He, he's got that clear principle all through Scripture that we are to go submit to authority and we must recognize God established it. Y'all remember all through the Old Testament, God rose up the Babylonian Empire to do what? To judge Israel. But then God said, I'll bring them down too. And see, God brings up kingdoms. God brings down kingdoms. God establishes authority. God establishes rulers that we have today. The people that we have in our government positions, God has authorized that. And in some of your Bibles, the word there is ordained that. God has done that. That may make some of us uncomfortable. You say, well, I don't like the person that's leading me. God, for this time, for this moment, has ordained it. Oh, by the way, when Daniel was serving foreign gods or foreign kingdoms, not gods, foreign kingdoms, he submitted to them. What did Joseph do? He submitted to them. That is exactly what God tells us to do. But keep reading. Look at verse Two, therefore, now look at these words, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. He's saying if we go resist the authority and the laws of the land and the direction, we are opposing God. And they who are opposed will receive condemnation on themselves. Resisting your government authority is opposing God's sovereign work. And you may go, wow, pastor, that's, uh, that's pretty tough. That's what the Bible says. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. Does God have laws established through our government? Things like thou shalt not murder, right? We're happy about that. He has laws like, okay, we don't want to sell and carry illegal drugs. We're happy about that. But the ones that we struggle with a lot of times is those signs that are, you know, they're on the road you know, that had speed limit on them, you know, or some of those kind of things that we struggle sometimes with. I remember, I think I've told you, I had this car I loved when I was young. It was, a, it was fire engine red, a Mustang. I loved that car. White bucket seats. I've, I've thought in the past, man, I wish I still had that car, you know. I mean, it was great. It was not only a pretty car, it would go real fast, you know, and Everybody in the room hear me. Do not do what I'm about to say I did, you know. But I, I, I was at that time living in Mississippi. And if you've ever been in that farm country in Mississippi, it's just flat for miles. The first time I took Cynthia there, she's like, man, it is sure is flat around here, you know. But you get on one of those state highways on a beautiful day, and I was in that car and decided, you know, let's just kind of check this thing out a little bit. And you know what happens whenever you do that? All of a sudden, there's flashing lights, you know? And that's exactly what happened to me. And was the government authority wrong? Not at all. Was the government authority nice and polite to me? He sure was. Did he give me a ticket? He sure did, you know? And uh, did I have to go pay a fine? Yes. And what does it say in this text? It says, those who have opposed will receive condemnation. One of the forms of condemnation is we get judgment on ourselves. Sometimes it's in the form of a ticket. Sometimes it's in the form of jail time. Sometimes it's in the form of some restrictions that are placed upon us. But in this text, he says, do not resist government authority. We obey the laws of the land. We are to be good citizens 
He is reminding us God has established government, and we're going to talk about this for our good. It is not for our bad. It is for safety. It is for restraint of evil. It is for order in society. The policemen that we have are part of our governing, governing authorities. They are there for our good. When I hear things in our society today about mocking and talking bad about the police or saying abusive things, I'm sure, listen, in no profession, there's not perfect people in any profession. But as a general rule, they are established and in place for our good. And we must remember that. And that's what he's telling us in this text. And he's also telling us, I'll get to this later in the message, but we need to remember God's design for government so that when we vote, we want people that want a government that is for our good, our safety, restraint of evil, and for order. That's one of the reasons God has government. Look, look there in verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. Did you catch that? You ever thought about that? Not a cause of fear for good behavior. Stay with that same example about driving. Do you ever sometimes drive and all of a sudden you see that car on the side of the road and your very first response is either to hit the brake or look at the speedometer? Why? It's a cause of fear because you're not following the law. You're not submitting to the government. That's what he's talking about. He goes, there's no reason for, he says, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. He's basically saying, if you obey the law, you don't have anything to worry about. But for evil do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Verse 4, for it is a minister of God to you for good. Now, I'm going to stop there. I want to make sure you get that. It's very obvious, but let's make sure we capture it. We have no reason to fear government if we obey the laws of the land. He says, far too often we want to be rebellious, hard-headed, do things our way, rely on our opinions, our feelings, our judgment, instead of obeying government. And oh, by the way, I'll say it again. I don't even like it sometimes saying it, but the Bible says, obey the government, even if you don't agree with everything they have there, you obey the government. But he says something else there. I'll stop reading there in verse 4. For it is a minister of God to you for good. Did you catch that word? That word there is like government authorities are ordained by God and they are ministers, servants. You could almost say that word, or not almost, it's, it's like our word deacon, but he's really saying they are servants to society put in place by God for good. But look at the back half of verse 4. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. Now look at these words on how it describes the government. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God. That's the second time he says that. An avenger, he's talking about the government now, is an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. What is God saying? He goes, oh, listen. He said government can bear the sword. Government can pour out wrath. Government is an avenger. And what is he saying to us? He says government is established to address and restrain evil in our society. That's one of the reasons that we have people in roles to say, no, you can't break the law. That's why we have judges in jails. He says, excuse me, government is established to restrain evil. But he goes further than that. And I want to explain this today. He uses words here, sword, avenger, wrath. We're going to look at another passage of Scripture. Sometimes Christians are uh, confused about this. Does the Bible say that capital punishment is okay? When I use the word capital punishment, I mean the death penalty. I mean, is that really okay? And the Bible here is saying that it is. And I want to make sure we understand that. Christians get confused on this subject. God says there is order in society and evil must be addressed. But some people go, well, wait a minute. You in the church will say abortion is wrong, but you say capital punishment is right. Have you ever heard somebody argue about that? Well, that's two different things. Abortion is murder. It's killing a child. 
And he's saying, if we intentionally commit murder, that is wrong. And so that deserves, he's saying, when we go, if I walk out that door and I intentionally shoot someone to kill them, not accidentally, intentional, then that deserves capital punishment. And go to Genesis 9, verse 6. If someone asks you these questions, we said that one of our goals as a church is to grow together. We should be clear on this subject for each of us. In Genesis 9, verse 6, the flood has happened. There's eight people left on the earth. Noah and his family. They're coming off the boat. And uh, God says, I want to make sure you understand Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Did you catch that? If you kill someone and you're doing it, if you go in the Mosaic Law, there's probably more description on that. But he said, if you intentionally go murder someone, then that life is to be taken. For in the image of God, he made man. He comes back in Romans chapter 13, and he says the government can be an avenger, a carrier of the sword, one who pours out wrath. Now, it should be with deliberation. If you want to go through the Mosaic law, he says, no, not accidental death, not that kind of death, but intentional, willful, thought-out murder deserves capital punishment. So all these things we should know from Scripture. We should know that in how we vote. And I put other verses of Scripture there you can go look at. In Acts chapter 25, Paul is under arrest, and he even says to the governing authorities, if I've done something worthy of death, then kill me. He doesn't say capital punishment is wrong. He's just saying he hasn't done something worthy of killing someone, but he doesn't say it's wrong. I want to make sure we as Christians understand that. And if you're visiting today or you're listening online, never does the church want lives to be taken. But to have order in society, we have to have that law in place. And God shows that to us in Scripture. It's for the good of the masses that one might have to be punished. And oh, by the way, this is not, I'm adding my opinion now. My opinion, if we would practice more what the Bible says, we would have a better society. You know, actually, that is my opinion, but it's also biblical. Okay, so that's where those first verses go in verse, all the way through verse 5. Now, look at verse, through verse 4, look at verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And that's a unique verse. He goes, don't you just obey the government out of fear? He said, you don't just walk around scared that, wait a minute, I'm going to get in trouble, so I better obey the government. He is saying, we as Christians need to obey because of conscience sake. What does he mean by that? He goes, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit resides in you. Wait a minute, you're a child of the living God. He says, you know you're supposed to represent Jesus Christ every day. Your very behavior, your very words, the way you act in society, you should obey the law. You can't be saying, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, and people hear you joking about breaking the law, and people hear you joking about taking advantage of the government or cheating the government. He goes, no, that can't be the life of the Christian. He says, submit to government for our conscience' sake. And I typed that slide, so I don't know how I got that extra space in there. But anyway, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, he tells us very clearly. I already read that text, so I'll just read it to you. But he says, when we obey, it is the will of God. He has made it very clear to us that we are... He even says in 1 Peter, submit yourself to the government for the Lord's sake. He says we walk each day representing Jesus Christ. We are to, what's our goal? We want people to know Jesus Christ as Savior. We want them to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He goes, you can't say, hey, I'm against government. I don't like government. Let me tell you about Jesus. He goes, no. Your life should be upright as a good, strong citizen in society. Now, I'm sure by now you have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to answer them here over the next few minutes. But I got to cover that verse. I went, really? In verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, I'm sorry. I left that one blank out about the spirit 
leading us in talking about the conscience. But in verse 6, for because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants. That's the third time he mentions to us about government authority or servants, ministers of God. And he even says, you pay your taxes. Custom is really a word for another word for taxes. It would be like us paying a duty on certain goods or us paying property taxes on certain things. But it's just another form of saying tax. He says Christians are to pay taxes, and I'm going to break these into two statements and to honor. Now, y'all remember Matthew 22, 17 through 21? Y'all remember that, right? You remember Jesus has handed a coin? Y'all remember that? And what did Jesus say? He says, render under Caesar what is Caesar's. Remember that? That's exactly this principle. He, was, were taxes corrupt in that day and time? Yes, they were. Did he say still pay your taxes? Yes, he did. He says you as a Christian are to pay taxes. Now, I know some of you are going to be uncomfortable with what I'm about to say, but he is saying here we are to be law-abiding citizens and we are to pay our taxes and obey the laws of the land. Sometimes we'll say, oh, I'm not going to show my income to the government. That is breaking our law of the land. That is not what the government says. Now, that makes people uncomfortable, but the Bible here is telling us we pay taxes as a good citizen in the society that we live in. And oh, by the way, sometimes I'm with Christians and they're bragging about how I, I cheated, you know, on my taxes. Or I broke the law in a minor way. I covered this up. That is not to be the Christian. I told you that it would sting a little bit today by stepping on toes. Because scripture here says we pay taxes. And it says we honor our government. It doesn't say, honor the government leaders if you like them. And you know, in our society today, and I've probably fallen into this trap, and I was convicted even studying this, sometimes we can say unkind things about our government leaders. Would you, well, you don't have to agree with me. Maybe you don't want to affirm that out loud. But the point there is we can. And he says, no, we honor our government leaders at the local level, all the way to our federal level, and we are to go honor them. Does that mean we agree with them? It didn't say you have to agree with them. No. Does it say that we say, oh, you know, just whatever they say, I'm happy with it. No, it doesn't say that. But it does say we respectfully disagree and we show honor to every role throughout society. Now, why is God saying that in all of these things? He is telling us that we're to be good citizens. And I've got one other passage I want you to see. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, now this is the letter we use 1 Timothy to talk about qualifications for deacons. We use 1 Timothy to talk to us about qualifications for pastors. And right before those qualifications, here's what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 verse 1. He goes, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Keep reading 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What does he say? Our citizenship is important because we want people to come to know Jesus as Savior. Our citizenship is important. We need to pray for our authorities. We need to pray. Right now you might go, well, man, there's a whole bunch of people in government. I don't even like them. He says, pray for them. He says, pray. For whatever person is in office, we should pray. Now, about right now, you're going, I've kind of enjoyed Romans a whole lot, you know, until, you know, and maybe it's kind of like, I don't know if I even agree with all of this. Well, today what our answer should be is, Lord, I want to be exactly what you want me to be. 
And I want to be a good citizen in this society. And God tells us how we should respond. I've got about four or five things there I want you to see as we wrap up. The first one, submit to God. Don't miss the context. This starts in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, brethren, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. In Romans 12, 2, he says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And notice what he says in Romans 12, 2, that you may prove what the will of God is, that you may show what the will of God is, that people see Jesus in you. And under that context, he says, you obey your government. And he goes, it starts with, you got to submit to me. So today, each of us needs to say, Lord, it's more important to me to obey you. And if I've been wrong in any of these areas, I submit to you. Secondly, we need to honor, pray for, and submit to government authorities. That means we obey. We aren't willfully against the government. We honor, we pray for, and submit. Thirdly, we must vote. And you go, whoa, I didn't see vote in that text. Well, I want you to hear this. This is very important. Have we talked a lot of times that God is sovereign and that God has entrusted us with the wealth that we have, with our talents, with our abilities? Guess what else he's entrusted us with? He's given us citizenship in America. Y'all know I've visited communist countries. I have been in countries where people don't have the rights that we have. I've been in countries where people don't have the freedoms that we have. We have that freedom. That is a gift. It should not be taken for granted. And we are to be good stewards of our vote. In other words, since we live in a society where people can vote and influence the direction of government, we are to vote. Every Christian should vote. Not only that, we should vote according to biblical principles. Not opinions, not feelings. I've got a good friend that he says, well, you know, I'm just going to vote with a such and such party because I've always voted by party. And I'm like, you know what? The Bible doesn't tell me to vote by party. The Bible says vote at any level, local, state, federal, with who is closest to biblical principles. And I want you to make sure you hear me. We are stewards of that vote. God is going to hold us accountable for us as citizens of the society that we live in. And we should stop and think about that. Now, you go, well, pastor, what would guide me? Well, what guides me is, what does the Bible say? There's a lot of these policies that politicians have that I'm like, I'm not sure even how to discern every detail in that policy. But there are some we're clear on. The sanctity of human life is very clear in Scripture. It's not gray. It's not something we can debate about. The sanctity of human life is crystal clear. So if we're voting, that should be one of the first things we ask ourselves. And you go, well, what if I've got candidates? They both aren't as good as I want them to be. Well, then you look at the one that's closest to Scripture. Because I'm going to tell you, we got some candidates out there today, it is horrifying to me to hear how they are on human life, saying, oh, I'll just go for abortion all the way up to the ninth month. What? Well, I don't believe abortion is type of period. I'll be clear on that. But we're also people that will say, what about infanticide? Go back and look at Exodus chapter 1. Sanctity of human life should be one of our top ways to judge voting. A second one would be on what's going on in the area of gender. You see, the Bible's very clear. There's two genders, male and female. But what's our world saying today? Oh, there's all kind of craziness around genders today. But here's the part that is downright evil, is we're having children that will go in in some places to have gender surgery, reassignment surgery. That is absolute evil. Did everybody hear me on that? Evil. If a candidate is for that, they're not getting my vote. And they shouldn't be getting a Christian's vote. That is clear in Scripture around gender. So, again, sanctity of life. When we go look at gender, God's very clear there's two. And we should go look at this whole area of who's 
trying to destroy lives around this whole gender arena. The third area that I look at when I'm looking at voting, you might notice I didn't talk a whole lot about economy. I said I go look at LGBTQ, the family unit, who's protecting the family unit, who's endorsing everything to destroy the family unit, and if somebody's going to destroy, God established the family. God established one man, one woman, for life, and he's got us with distinctly marriages between a DNA man and a DNA woman. There is not an embracing of LGBTQ. Now, oh, by the way, if someone in here is visiting and wondering about that, listen, we love people, and we want every person in any walk of life to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But... LGBTQ is not biblical. Very clear in Scripture that it is not. Undermining the family and destroying the design that God has is not biblical, and we should vote against those. So I gave you a sampler. Those are three that I would look at very clearly when I go to look at making that decision. But we must vote. And then I'm going to wrap up here, but we also need to engage. Christians somehow believe, I remember my grandmother telling me, I was probably about 16 or 17, and she was proud of me and encouraging me, but one thing she told me, don't get involved in government. I still remember, she said, don't, that's a bad place to be, don't get involved in government. What was she saying? It's a whole bunch of mess there, and I don't ever want you to get tangled up in that at all. And sometimes we as Christians think, I'll just be silent. No, the Bible tells us in Matthew 5 to be salt and light. The Bible tells us to stand for truth. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, Speak the truth in love. We should be clear on the truth of Scripture and stand for it in our society. We should not be silent. Quite frankly, you could look at laws that have been put in place over the last 50 years in our society, and some of them have been put in place. We'll complain about them today because we were silent as a church. Did y'all hear me on that? We should be clear and engage. God may call some of you to say, I'm going to run for office. God puts people in there to go influence things. Look at where he put Daniel and Joseph. Engage. Speak truth in love. I can remember being in work years ago and a guy asked me, go, you for real? You're not for abortion? He, it was almost like he said it like, gosh, I always thought you were a pretty good guy, you know? But see, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not for abortion. I'm for life. Now, I didn't have to say that in an ugly way, but we need to speak up and be people that proclaim truth. The last verse there in your notes is Colossians 3.17. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, that includes voting, that includes our everyday conversations, it says what? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be people that stand for His truth. But lastly, all of these things are important. But the most important thing is God is telling us to be good citizens because we must be the light that shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. Solution to a society is not government. Did you hear me that? We're going to have a presidential election in November, and regardless of who is elected, they are not the solution to the good society. Jesus is our solution. Now, we should vote. I'm going to vote. You should vote. I'm going to encourage you to vote. But our bottom line solution is Jesus Christ. We must share the gospel. Because there is an eternity. Jesus is the only way. Our sin separates us from God. If you're sitting in this room, I'll ask you right now, if you were to die right now, will you be in heaven? And if you say, I don't know, you need to talk to me or someone today. If you say, I'm going to take my chances, that's foolish. If you say, you know, I don't really know, even if there is a heaven and a hell, there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment. God says our sin separates us from God. And without Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ, no one goes to heaven. Only to be covered by the blood of Jesus. Only understanding He paid it all and we put our faith in Him is the only way 
And that is our primary message out of Buena Vista Baptist Church. We want people to hear the gospel of Jesus. And that's really the reason God tells us to be good citizens. He says, you represent me. And you need to make sure that in your lifestyle and in your behavior, you do nothing to deter the cause of Christ. Now, you know, I think we're going to do something a little different today. We are going to sing, but I want you to bow your heads. And as your heads are bowed, some of you might feel led. I would love for you to just come up here to the altar and let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our government leaders. I invite you to just come up here and pray with me. We're going to do that before we even sing. Let's just pray for our government leaders. And I ask that you come and join me here at the altar. I think that we need to do that. Uh, don't y'all agree that our country needs that prayer? Even, even preaching this message, I know that it's 12 o'clock, but we should pray. And so I want you to just join me, and then we'll have an invitation. This is kind of an invitation as well. Let's just pray. While people are moving, I'm going to go in and have my head bowed. Lord, I just come before you right now. We pray for our local authorities. We give thanks for our policemen. We give thanks for all the authorities at this level in our counties that we live in. We thank you for our governor as him, as our leader. We pray for him to know Jesus. We pray for him to follow Jesus. I pray, Lord, that our state representatives and state senators follow Jesus, lead them. I pray, Lord, for Senators McConnell and Paul, that you will lead them. I pray, Lord, that you will lead President Biden, Vice President Harris. I pray, Lord, that you will lead Speaker of the House Johnson, our leader of the Senate, McConnell, Schumer, the different leaders that we have. Lord, we pray for every leader in our land to know Jesus as Savior. We pray, Lord, that all evil will be hindered. We pray, Lord, that you will move among the leaders of our land, that even today they will be drawn to Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that even in the coming elections, that the elections, that leaders will turn more toward you and govern according to Scripture, aligned with biblical commands. Lord, lead our country. Lord, we pray that we will be good citizens, that we'll represent you, that we will vote responsibly, that we will vote faithfully. And Lord, I pray that each of us will stand for you and be light in this world. But Lord, we lift up to you every one of our government leaders and Lord, we lift them up to say we honor them and we pray for your spirit to convict them and lead them. I pray, Lord, for a revival and a turning to you in our land. We praise you. I pray, Lord, you will lead in the coming elections. Your will be done. We trust you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. For those of you that are visiting, we're going just a little bit longer today than normal. But quite honestly, we need to pray for our land. Now, we always have an invitation at the end, and that invitation is very simply this. If you say, you know what, I need to find a church home, we'd love to talk to you about that. If you say, I need Jesus as Savior, we'd love to talk to you about that, and I invite you to do that. If you have other things in your life, or maybe there's things that you just say, I need to talk to the Lord some more, you can do it in your pew or here at the altar or with me. But I encourage you to have repentance in your heart today. It's probably one of the great things we need in our society is repentance and in the church. And so I ask you to stand right now. Brother Brett's going to lead us as we sing. You can put that last slide there, uh, up there. It's just a reminder that we follow our government and it fits perfectly with what we're saying. It's what we're going to be as a church. Brother Brett, why don't you lead us?